Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are going to be videoing. This is not being live streamed because we want to make sure you came. But um, we will share this for those people who were not able to be here. So I have two things to ask. One, if you would silence your cell phones so that way it won't disrupt the video uh, if, if uh, it goes off. And the other is that when you ask your questions, we are going to ask you to use the microphone. So even though you feel like you have a great uh, voice that projects in the room, um, it won't pick up on the video and we want to make sure we capture all the questions. Marcy has an additional microphone in the back. I can't say has an additional microphone in the back. I can't say yeah. So she can, she can uh, we will pass this around in the front area, but for those in the back, AM will provide you with a microphone. So please use it when you're asking questions. Um, I want to, uh, again, thank you all for your professionalism and your patience and everything that you did to reassure students. And I think we have some students here, and I'm really glad you guys are here. We want to hear from you. Um, I really especially want to thank our campus safety. Um, I'm going to go through a timeline, tell you kind of how this all happened and emerged. But Roland has been at the center of it the entire way, and our uh, campus safety team, you guys were amazing. And I really uh, cannot thank you enough for everything. I also want to thank uh, Mark Posner. He was uh, working with the media across the street. We had a little uh, area across the street, which was actually was really helpful. They didn't have to come onto campus. Um, I know that they you probably saw a lot of things in the news. Mark was front and center and sharing the information. We had a lot of compliments from the news media, just that we were very clear on what was happening, gave them regular updates. And I really thank you, Mark, for your role in that, as well as uh, keeping all of us informed. Uh, so I want to go over a, a, a just a brief timeline. Some of it has been included in our um, updates, but some of you may not have read them, heard them, and there might be some new information in here. I just I put my notes down so I wouldn't forget anything. Okay, so around 10 o'clock on Sunday night, um, the Whittier Police Department received a call from a relative of the former student at Cypress that we eventually did identify, um, that there was a threat um, that he was going to shoot these schools. So that's, that's pretty vague, right? He lived in, lives in Pedro Rivera, so that's why it was called into the Whittier Police Department. Um, in their investigation of this um, the student, it, they found an arrest report that had come from the Cypress Police Department. So Cypress then reached out to Roland, and then Roland called me. So at that point, we didn't have a lot of information. We weren't really quite sure the history of the student on the campus. And so we didn't want to immediately overreact and assume that the school was Cypress College. So we did a little research, and um, again, this is where everybody comes in and is, uh, is, is a team and helps us find this information. So uh, Roland called David Booth at home. David helped to, go, to walk our campus safety through records to look at the student's history. That's when we discovered we had, uh, there was a vandalism uh, assault at the uh, campus. He had been suspended from the campus. Um, and so at that point, we started getting a little more concerned that Cypress College might be one of my uh, target. So um, I called our athletics department and talked with people who knew this student, got a little bit more alarmed based on what they were telling us. Um, and then we also discovered that uh, he had been on campus twice last week in the athletics department. We also had an incident that we didn't have an identified uh, person where somebody had climbed up the mural and was on, pointing up here, but it's actually the third floor, was on the balcony um, uh, above our, on our third floor of this building and had been making um, mock shooting motions up there. So we immediately called the police. This was on Thursday the 22nd. And we, uh, by the time we, it, by the time we could 
get our campus security and try to, the person had disappeared and we couldn't, we couldn't find that person, so we were not able to identify. So we wondered if the lines were, that there was any connection with this. So we were able to get a photo, and that took a little, a little while to kind of track to see where we could find a photo. There were lots of phone calls involved with that. And we were able to get a photo and we did determine that that was the same person. So now we're on, okay, we're in a big, we have a high alert now. So that's when we made the decision that we would, keep, we would have a campus closure in the morning. Um, we wanted to give time for the Whittier police to go to this person's home and, uh, and detain him. Um, but we didn't want to take the time to know, we didn't know where it was, so we didn't know if that would affect the morning. Okay, so we decided we would let you know as soon as, as possible Close the campus so everybody was informed ahead of time rather than getting finding out at 6 a.m. And um, so that's why we made that decision. So if you know these are things that you look back on and you say, well, you know, did we do the right thing? I think we did the right thing in this case, and we didn't want to be disruptive to you. We had some questions on why was the phone call not made. We discussed that and we thought, you know, it's 10:45 at night. Half of you are asleep. The, the phone call is a robot. That's much more alarming, and we really didn't want you to wake up to a robot call. So we thought the text and the email would um, suffice. I, I understand some of some of you didn't get the text. That's why we did send the email out and another notification early in the morning. So if you were sleeping blissfully on Sunday night, which we hope you were, you would at least get it before you. So that's kind of the chronology of some of the decision making. Um, our campus safety immediately moved to uh, block our entrances. So anybody who didn't get the message, we could turn away. And again, the idea was that we wanted to have an open campus. Oh, and I should, I actually should also mention, we discussed this thoroughly with our chancellor. And those of you who didn't see, I'm sorry to introduce you, um, Cheryl, our chancellor is here also to be part of this discussion. So thank you, Cheryl. So, Cheryl and I spoke to what the action was that we should be taking. Um, so uh, again, we wanted to have an open campus so we could really assess what was happening in the morning, determine if um, this person was taken into custody, which he was, we found that out around 7 a.m. And so then that, that made us feel a little bit better about starting making the plans and notifying the media, being able to reopen the campus, uh, we met with the managers at 8.30, so everybody was involved in decision making. That's when they went and called most of you who are staff and faculty to come in for an early meeting. Um, the, the, the reason we wanted you to come in a little before noon is so that we could fully be on campus so when we reopened, we could provide the best environment for our students when students came back in the afternoon. Um, we are hiring additional security personnel, and I think we can, we'll talk a little bit about that too. We have some talking points that you have asked questions, um, so we're, we're, we've divided that among our panel up here to address some of the questions that have already come in through the, the um, link that we set up. I want to thank Ty Bolsey because she has been helping to keep us organized as well as set up that link for you and then put this all into an organized format. So thank you. Uh, for all the um, we also sent out a photo this morning. Again, we, we wanted to make sure we had all of the information updated the campus this morning. Um, and uh, the uh, young man was still in, in custody, so we didn't feel that it was urgent need to, to clutter your email yet again uh, yesterday, but we did send that out today. So if you haven't seen that yet, that is out to all students and all um, employees so they have a picture of, of the young man. Um, the final thing that I wanted to add is that we, um, uh, Dr. Lagopade, uh, sent an immediate interim the suspension. He had been on suspension since 2016, but it had expired. So that's what allowed him legally to be on campus last week. Um, he now, there's now an interim suspension, and we are recommending expulsion, which is a forever ban, and that has to go to the board, but the interim suspension allows us to, to uh, make sure that there's 
that if he attempts in any way to come on campus, he will be removed. The last piece of work, we're looking at the legal options so that we can issue a restraining order, which allows the police to act. So if he, so a suspension means we can ask him to leave. Um, but when you have a restraining order, that means the police can arrest the person. So those are the, some of the steps that we've taken to make sure that this individual does not come back on campus ever. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that to start some of the, um, answering some of the questions that you've already put in and, and uh, start our discussion. And you will have time to answer, to ask questions as well. And feel free as we're going through some of these questions, if you have additional questions in that theme or if, you, if we aren't clear on what we're talking about that you want clarification, we'll be happy to, to answer at that time. Um, okay, so let's see, where should we start here? Um, I think I answered a couple of the questions about, uh, someone asked about the name and image of the person um, and why it hasn't been released, so we have done that. And um, so why don't we go to you, Emily, um, who had a, we had a question about active shooter training. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm for the spring term, uh, we want to continue with our culture of preparedness and arming the students as well as the employees on campus with the knowledge and the training of what the best practices are during an active shooter. So for the spring term, we've identified April 5th as for the active shooter drill. We're still finalizing the details of that drill and um, the information will go out later this week. The other thing we're doing, uh, slotting for the spring break time frame is to train our floor marshals and our building marshals on what a bomb down of the campus would be like. Um, so one of the comments that was shared with us was, you know, we have the posters on campus of um, run, hide, or fight, what would that look like for your individual areas, taking assessment of where your classrooms are, where your offices are, where your general workspace is. Um, so the additional thing that will be coming in the future is we're having kind of a train a trainer with Cypress PT. So Chief Cox will be training our uh, campus safety department and then we can have meetings with individual divisions and departments really to assess you know, what's the best place to uh, run to, what's the best place to hide, what can we use to distract or disarm uh, the safety like that. So the immediate training will be April 5th, and before that, during we're targeting the spring break time frame for our building and floor marshal training, and then in the future, we're looking at um, meeting with individual departments and divisions to do that uh, classroom and workspace assessment. Oh, yeah, I have a question on when, when, uh, when, when, when that happens. When, when that, when, I have a question when that, that happens. Um, uh, I, I was training at a hand campus when the when the, uh, there's an actor shooter in the in the school that to uh, before hiding close close turn off the lights and because if you don't turn off the lights then the person that the actor shooter can know that there's somebody inside the classroom that, that's that's about it that I'm representing my, my disabled students program thank you thank you guys for sharing that with us. One of the drill, the first phase of the drill is that we will be asking um, when the, we're simulating the uh, lockdown procedures to you know, lock your doors, turn off your lights, turn off anything that would possibly make a sound. So really, um, you know, noting what uh, you guys shared is to turn off the lights as part of that drill. Albert Peter, do you want to add to that? Um, Albert, do you want to share with us to some of the things that we're doing in our buildings and then um, also about our texting system, Peter? 
So basically, we, we've actually been installing uh, bulletproof down in, in most of the exterior windows of the buildings, and we have automatic lockdown systems in place where we actually, by a push of a button, we can lock down uh, the entire facilities. All the classrooms nowadays have actually uh, a way to lock the door from the inside of the classroom. So that in the old system, you had to actually come out of the door and lock the building from the outside. Now you can do that just to push the button from the inside. But at least we've made some progress in some of those areas. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, from a technology perspective, uh, the screens that we have within the buildings are going to be a uh, centralized message. Um, so notification systems are going to improve on that end. And we are in the mix right now of the decision on the mobile application as part of a, a mechanism for distributing content. So that's coming up, and that's going to be uh, possibly a release in summer. Um, we also have. Um, uh, the, the blue, the code blue cones, uh, that technology for making announcements around campus. So we are really tapping into that as a method of distributed uh, information for those folks. Hello, um, my name is Maria Alvarez and I'm the Associated Student President. I've been talking to several students and some of their concerns are when you guys have the safety drill, is that going to be a uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, Thursday classes? There was a lot of night students' concerns that they've been on this campus for over three years and haven't been part of a drill. So, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, um, I'll one of the dates that we had selected was a Thursday, and I hear what you're saying the need for um, an earlier day drill and then an evening drill. So we're still finalizing the times, but it is our intention to have the drill in uh, the late morning and then in the early evening part of the class schedule. Okay, and so then the Cypress Police Department would be the ones that's going to be training on campus. So we, so as as I learned in the leadership meeting we had um, a couple of months back, if there was an active shooter on campus, our safety um, officers would be calling the police department. And what about the time that's in between that we're waiting for the police department to show up? How will students um, be secure in the hallways or wherever they're at if we're waiting for the police department to show up? Is there, an, is there going to be an active plan now from our campus safety during that time? And how are they going to protect us if they are unarmed? The good thing about the uh, Cypress Police Department is they don't uh, respond from the station. They are patrolling the city all the time. So there could be a patrol unit within blocks of the campus or, or in a short distance. Uh, once anything is happening, happening that's uh, of a significant uh, response, uh, they're going to notify uh, the no neighboring uh, Buena Park. Other agencies would be responding as well. So uh, they put it out on frequencies to make sure as many people get here to deal with any situation that's going to happen. We have a layers of response, things we're, we would be trying to do, like shutting down, uh, closing up buildings, uh, but also being able to uh, bring the person up or find the area uh, covered, uh, covered with cameras and determine if we can verify that something is happening, a uh, description of that person. A lot of people will call 911 and say something's happening and give no information whatsoever. So it, it's not necessarily beneficial uh, to the police department, the responding officers. If safety can get on uh, our camera system and visibly see what's going on and describe to the officers that are responding the exact description, we can take photographs, we can send them to officers, we can uh, give them live almost information uh, for the responding officers so that they know exactly what they're getting involved with, what they're, uh, who they're looking for, and even if the guy has left our campus, he might be uh, blocks off our uh, campus, the officers from Cyprus or the patrol officers in the area would be able to spot him quicker if campus safety is able to uh, get this information. So you're, there's just so many different layers of things we'd be doing to make sure that as much information is getting to the police as possible. My question is, when has the Cypress Police Department come train here? When has the Buena Park Police Department come train here? When and how often are they doing that? And are they able to know the departments and areas of this campus and 
if they have different officers on the ship, are they going to be trained as well? Is everybody going to be trained in handling the situation? Yeah, so the Cypress Police is here a lot. They know our campus intimately. But in terms of your question about the training, and you also asked an earlier question about what happens in that time between an incident and their arrival. So um, the training, we're, Cypress Police is going to be coming and working with our campus safety team, sort of a train and trainer. And then our campus safety will be going to each and every area to help to identify all of those things that you need to know in the, in the uh, event of an attack. So the idea is that we all have, we are all responsible for being equipped and we need to be trained, we need to know what to do because regardless if we had armed guards on campus or if we are relying on a police department, there is going to be a moment when you still need to know what you're supposed to do. So things like don't stand in front of a drywall, that wall behind you there, but this is a concrete wall. So we're going to help you do an inventory of your both your workspace and for students, their classroom, and that will be part of the active shooter drill too in your classrooms. Take an inventory. What is it we do? What is a weapon that we would use? You know, anything from a stapler to your phone, those are all weapons, right? Because those are distractions. So that's what our active shooter drill will go over, and then our Cypress Police will help train our campus staff to help do a little bit more detailed training in every um, workspace environment. And then in terms of, again, the response time, the more we know where do we run, where do we hide, how do we fight, those things are essential for us, whether you're on campus here at Cypress or whether you're going to the grocery store. That's unfortunately the world we live in that we know how to protect ourselves, the better each one of us in this room will be. So does that kind of answer the question? Yes, but as um, on the safety procedures that are on the Cypress College website, I don't think students are, they know about the safety procedures and I think they should be, um, they should be announced in the first day of school. And so students know what to do in case of emergency. They need to be walked through those procedures because I, I know a lot of students don't even know we have the procedures online. And they need to be updated for all of the um, things that are occurring nowadays. Maria, we do share those in advance of the drills. They are built out on the website. So your, your point about sharing them the start of the semester is well taken, uh, but they are shared on a regular basis. Hi, I'm Devin Barner. Um, a lot of concern that a lot of concerns that the students had um, was when campus was supposed to start up again after 12 o'clock. A lot of um, faculty was not um, communicating with their students effectively, so where they didn't know if their classes were canceled or if they were still going to resume after 12 o'clock. Um, and there was a lot of students that were left in the hallways of the, I know for one, for the humanities building. Um, and it was very frightful for the students and they didn't know what to do. So if there could be a way to have more effective communication with the, the profession, professors to the teachers, I mean the professors to the students, that would help the students a lot feel safer. I'm curious if you might quantify that a little bit more, what, what specific from the faculty members would have been beneficial to you that didn't come from the college as a whole. I think that would help us work through it. It doesn't have to be now, but if you want to share that information with us, we can include that in some of the training that, that we do down the road. Um, there wasn't like uh, the students were saying that there wasn't an email sent out to them after like they were checking their emails to see if after 12 o'clock if their classes would be canceled or not and maybe it was because of the adrenaline going through or like being the teachers were also frightful but it was they weren't told if the classes were going to continue or not through email um, because nobody has text message or if there can be an app that every student is like required to download and know like we have the um, our um, employee email, if we could have like one for students to where we have an app, like the, the office app also, so we can be, the communication can be better. Okay, that, that's helpful, and yes, I think that's how we envision using the app. Um, right, you know, the faculty members were not instructed to communicate individually because we had communicated as a 
campus that any of the classes that began at noon or later would be in session. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is my name is Robert. I'm the executive vice president for Associated Students, and um, I want to add to what Maria had said about um, what had the campus safety had said about uh, the layers. With the layers, it takes time. With the time, it takes time. It gives the shooter the um, threat more time. So campus safety, what I got from what you had said was that campus safety is going to be the police's eyes. And you had said that police patrol, but sometimes patrols go a little off bar. And I was just wondering what would be the time, because in Florida it only took six minutes for that shooter to do what he had done. So is there some ideas that are being pushed to make the time uh, smaller or the layers faster and easier to Accomplish. I can tell you Cyprus isn't that big of a city and the patrol units are assigned areas to be in. They're not just going off wherever they feel like going. So if there should always be an assigned unit in this area unless they've made an arrest, unless they're doing something else, but then other units would know that and they would in turn fill in the gaps and be in an area so that they're, they're always spread throughout the city. Uh, Cyprus Police Department, I think, has uh, like 65 officers uh, for the entire department. And uh, like I said, if there was a problem, it's put out on the radio, and Wayne Park and other neighboring cities would be responding as well. As far as somebody, you know, that, that's what all these layers do is by locking doors, by uh, making things more difficult for the person to move from uh, one classroom to another or one building to another, this gives us that time for police to respond. Uh, there, there is no way to guarantee that we could stop somebody before they even get here. And so, without that, there, there's always going to be that response. But uh, I'm very confident, and I've seen good responses from the Cypress Police Department for the eight months that I've been here. And uh, that's just on normal, everyday type activities. I can only imagine that if something really was happening here, we'd get a better response. So um, from the last leadership um, meeting that I think we had before accreditation, one of the uh, topics was the, the film they guys had put over the glass. But with those doors, those doors are easily pushed. If you're inside, you can push. I understand that's a fire hazard, but is there some way that we can maybe change that to where they can't get in if somebody was to exit through? We are looking at the doors all the time. Uh, different issues with doors. We're, we're looking at securing them better. We're looking at uh, uh, verifying that they lock when they're supposed to lock. We're looking at the programming and such doors. So this is something we're looking at all the time. Is there any ideas about campus safety and how they can train? I understand we're doing training, but is there any other ideas that they can do as a first time response or as a first responder? I was going to answer the question about the doors. The doors that you mentioned are usually the slider doors that actually you could panic, panic out. We are looking into that to see how else we could improve those things. So, yes, it's still in our radar to do something. And then any ideas about the um, first-time responders for the campus safety? I know the campus safety doesn't, aren't armed, and I don't want them. I wouldn't want them to be armed just because walking around on campus and seeing um, you know, a gun isn't really the most you know, best environment for education to be having, but is there some type of weapon like maybe a beanbag um, or something to neutralize the threat at least, or to put time in between the threat and the people running away from them? Well, uh, beanbags are, are called less than lethal, but they can still be lethal yeah. if you're too close. So there, there are so many issues with uh, firearms and tasers and all, all these uh, array of uh, responses that could be used. But I can tell you that the first thing we need to do in any situation is to identify that a threat is actually happening, what that person looks like, uh, give a location, things like this. Uh, I can tell you that when we get a call into campus safety, oftentimes somebody gets on the phone we need somebody at this room, this building, and hangs up. And so we need to think about what we're doing. And, and if the police get the same call, they're, they're just as limited as campus safety. Nobody is going to be able to 
uh, magically appear and know what to do if we're not given information. So you have to think about what you're saying, giving a good description, giving a good uh, description of the situation and what the problem is, so that we know whether we need to send an ambulance for somebody who's passed out in the classroom, or whether we need to send uh, police uh, with some kind of armed response because of somebody who has a weapon. So there are very different responses, and we don't always get that from people who call. So it, my best thought is to give some thought to what you would say. It's, it's, it's a role play type game. Give some thought to what you would say on a phone to the police if you saw something so that you could give the most information in the least amount of time because that's really what everybody's looking for. Now, while at the same time, while 100 people are calling the communications, I can tell you the police are still responding. They're getting updates from communications. As soon as they get that one caller who can give some good information, they are relaying that to the officers that are responding to the scene while they're still taking more phone calls trying to determine if we can get a better location, a better uh, description, uh, additional information. So it's a, it's a fluid thing. It's, it's continuously uh, answering uh, calls and giving out information. And it's just a big circle and it just keeps going until officers are on scene and they can describe to responding officers what they need <laughs> and the additional resources that, that uh, they might need. I, I understand um, like the communication line, but I was just wondering what would be the first responders, the campus safety who's already on the campus that can react to the, into the threat within a minute <coughs> And what will they be training on to say not neutralize, but just to give time for the We'd be doing the same thing I'm asking you to do, which is to give, give information. information to the police. Robert, can I add to? The reason we're here today is not because of that one minute response that you're talking about. It is because of the see, say something, see something, say something. But we have had someone who um, made a threat to a family member, and that family member called the police department. And that is it's our crazy. best prevention in this kind of environment. We've just started a credit assessment group called CHAT. And, you know, and, and what we really need is to identify those things that are issues, not sit on them, because, because that issue we've seen over and over again with threats. So you know, if your tire blows out while you're driving on the freeway, only your preparation helps you deal with that. Well, AEM is taking the microphone. I also want to remind everyone that every single manager at Cypress College carries one of these, and that is in an active shooter situation. This is an internal uh, walkie-talkie system that is not accessible to whoever might be the bad guy, right? So this is a way for us to get current and immediate uh, conversation going that every manager would have access to. So again, on a campus as large as ours, that, that communication, being able to anticipate um, and identify where the threat is coming from will be absolutely key to LP to protect all of you. Dave Garcia, I'm a student here at the school. Uh, I understand that the shooter, well, the possible shooter, could have gone, or well, was standing on the jail lot here. Uh, and the fine arts building is facing right there. Uh, I know that you have been putting in bulletproof glass, but it is also cost prohibitive. Um, my question is if it would be possible to somehow maybe black out the large windows until that sort of issue can be resolved. Because if you can't offer cover, possibly the next, yeah, the next best thing would be some sort of concealment, so that way they can't look in through the windows uh, to shoot. I'm gonna let Albert address this, and I, but I also want to remind, which I didn't put in my timeline, that it was determined that this particular person did not have a firearm registered, and when they ser police searched his house, there was no evidence of firearms. So we all know um, that's not always exactly conclusive proof, but um, in this case also, this person, he was a threat, he acted, but he also actually didn't have the weapon that we were fearing. So I'm gonna let Albert talk to you about, about the windows. 
if I understood correctly, what you're asking is uh, block out the window so you don't see on the inside? Uh, just like, yeah, just the big windows. Cause oh, pretty much 80% of the outside windows on this campus have been bulletproof. There's about three buildings that haven't been done yet, which are on phase two, which will happen in between July and August, most likely we'll get those done. So at least basically the humanities building, the science building, the fine arts building, the theater, the business building, the student center, uh, the library building, and the technical three have all been uh, done with the bullet program. Okay. Uh, just off the top of my, uh, from what I heard, it's something like uh, class one, sort of bulletproof class. That's, that's typical in most cases. That's typically what you have a Okay, yeah, because uh, against rifles, that's not really going to work. Understood, but that is what the recommendations were from, from the specialists that came on campus. That's exactly the, the type of window film that we use in, in the banks and areas of that nature. I do understand that there's heavier weapons out there that probably um, may not be able to stop that. Yeah, which is uh, they're usually carrying the heavier weapons when they shoot the schools, which is why I'm saying if, uh, why not provide an extra level of protection such as concealment so that way they can exactly aim through the window without having to shoot the window out first. We've done what we have recommended for us to do and again that, that to us has been we haven't tested it out to see who is a heavier uh, uh, gun will go through it and we didn't go through the testing on, on certain uh, uh, size of bullets and so forth and we've seen how that performed. That it performed to the satisfaction of the consultants and experts that we uh, Brought in to help us in making the decision of what product to that. Okay, because uh, it's only a couple of dollars for a bucket of paint. And that, that but for, that it's not a perfect science. I mean, we've done the best that we could with what we have. It's probably best than, than many other institutions that have nothing. Okay. I understand that there's going to be a day where you guys are going to go through um, in the early morning and the e early evening, correct, of uh, training, would there be a possible way that every professor could be emailed a, like, say, a, uh, a PowerPoint on how to go through the procedures, you know, and for, like, when they go through their syllabus and stuff, that we could also see it so every individual student would be prepared for a situation? For the April 5th drill, we were going to send out to um, the employees basically the talking points and discussion points to have with their, uh, with their direct reports and with their students. Um, we can work in a PowerPoint to better present this information. Yeah, because my only concern is for like, say like I or another student wasn't here on the 5th, um, if we would, if, for the opening of every class, we can go through that. Yeah. Like in, for, in the next um, session or something. That's doable. Yeah. I know this institution has done everything they can uh, considering uh, um, purchasing the windows, but like I said, these are student concerns, and even if we have gone through them, I think we should recheck them again because students do still. We, we want to eliminate the fear that students have, and we want to assure them this is a safe place to be. I, my name is Mary. I'm a student here. I read in the email that you're hiring additional security for a short period of time, and I was curious if we would know the security company. Uh, the name of the company is Pack West. We have a contract with them uh, at the Anaheim campus. Uh, as well as, uh, well, for the entire district, the contract. And so uh, they were a company, a, a fairly large company that we were able to get the day after I requested uh, somebody on campus. So we have a security guard today uh, patrolling the campus in addition to the staff that we normally have. And uh, some of our staff is also on overtime today. So we had uh, additional people. Um, I also know of a video that might be helpful. I don't know if it was LAPD or LA Sheriff that put out a video about a sh active shooter, and I found that video very informative. Um, if anybody would like to watch that video, 
I recommend that video, but I don't know where to find it. I thought we had the LA County Sheriff's uh, video on our uh, My Gateway, yes, uh, for a time. I'm not sure if it's still up there, but that was an excellent video. It's the one I'm thinking of. Could we maybe put it back up if it's been taken down? We'll check. And how long will the, the, the company of which you hired, PacWest, be on the school campus? Uh, my understanding is it will be for the next couple of weeks. But uh, we, we continue to have our safety staff on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay. And I was still not clear on how we can ensure that the Cypress PD department has gone through a run through um, if there was an active shooter on the campus. Uh, like I was saying earlier, they're on our campus regularly. Yeah. Is, is there anything that we can have like signed from the police department that they've been here on the campus and know all the departments? They're here regularly taking reports and doing follow-up. We had investigators here uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We, they walk through our campus, they uh, go to different locations, they see uh, the insides of our buildings, they walk around to take reports, they respond to different areas of the campuses, different uh, lots. They're, they're here a lot, and they know our layout, and they respond to uh, medical or incidents as well. You'll see them on campus when uh, the fire department is responding sometimes, so they're aware of the best ways to get onto our campus, where the buildings are located. We have large signs, names, numbers on the sides of the building so that when we are uh, talking to them and we tell them to respond someplace, they can easily see where to go to. Uh, it, it, it's a regular thing, and I see the same officers all the time. So it's, it's a, something that they're uh, practicing all the time, uh, making sure that they get there as quick as possible. Okay, and after this incident, is Campus Safety gonna come up with another plan or are they going to stick to the same one? Maria, Maria sorry, let me, let me just add that, uh, you know, within the last couple of years, Cypress PD was here, they did an active shooter drill in the Humanities Building with, with weapons, with blanks, I mean, intimately familiar with the campus. To, to your other point about signed agreement, we have a very, very good relationship with the Cypress Police Department right now. Their Chief of Police, Rod Cox, sits on our foundation board. So we have really cultivated those relationships. There have been times in the past where the only way the department worked with us was through signed memorandum. So you know the better course of action for us has been a relationship building, and it is an incredibly solid relationship right now. So hopefully that puts you know a little bit of peace in your mind about about how we work with them and how they work with us. The the numbers on the buildings that Roland was talking about grew out of this type of cooperative relationship. And the roof, too. And if I can add as well, um, I I literally see Chief Cox every week at some event or not, and uh, Roland talks to him every week. They are an amazing police department. I can't thank them enough. They have been such good partners. We had a police department at our manager's meeting yesterday morning so he could hear what we were talking about, so he could also take it back. We're having a debrief with the Cypress Police tomorrow, uh, Thursday, um, that they initiated, so we could walk through all of the steps. What did we miss? What could we do better next time? Um, the very fact that we got this early alert is because of our good relationship with the Cypress Police. They got on it immediately, and they knew who to call. They have Roland's cell phone. So um, all of those are those partnership building. So you know, if students would feel more secure that we had something in writing, um, you know, we can do that. But I'm telling you, the piece of paper means nothing. It's the relationships, and that is absolutely a primary priority for us to make sure that those relationships are good because that's why we were able to get this early children, and that's what's going to save lives. We had an incident a couple of uh, months ago where a staff member had a problem in the city of Costa Mesa. It was an issue with a uh, online threat of sorts, and uh, she went to the Costa Mesa Police Department. They didn't help her. 
Uh, I had, uh, she contacted me, I told her, go to the Cypress Police Department. Even though you live in Costa Mesa, even though that is your police department where you live and you should be uh, dealing with them, go to the Coast, uh, Cypress Police Department, come to the station, we'll have them meet you here at Cypress uh, campus. And they took the report. They were, they worked with us very well and they worked with our staff, our students, and uh, everybody, they want to really extend themselves, even in areas where they didn't have to, and they knew it was another agency's jurisdiction. They still took the report just to assist the uh, staff member to get the ball rolling and to move forward rather than just keep uh, uh, sending a person back and forth to different locations. Uh, it's just another example of how Cypress works with us uh, when we call them. I have a question real quick. I'm sorry. I'm Dr. Teresa Mosqueda Ponce, and my students were asking, are there restrictions on them carrying pepper spray or tasers or, you know, what, what are the rules? We would prefer that nobody have weapons on campus of any type. That includes knives, things like that. We're, that would include knives and things like that, tasers. Uh, things like that. You can imagine if somebody got tased uh, on the stairwell and they rolled down the stairs, they, they, they could die. Uh, pepper spray uh, is a, uh, something that can be carried, but again, we don't want people using, let's say, pepper spray unnecessarily or uh, in a classroom and then it affecting a, a, a lot of people rather than uh, something that you might want to use uh, in your home or let's say you're uh, on, a, on a jogging on a run uh, at, near your home and, and you're, you're attacked by a dog, that's the time to have pepper spray and something like that. Uh, when you're in a campus community like this and we have so many people together, the best thing to do is really call safety, call 911 if it's appropriate and uh, let, the, uh, let them handle a situation rather than trying to deal with it uh, yourself. Um, okay, so I have a question. My name is Emily Marcus. So you said that April 5th would be the training for the active shooter. Yes. That's not soon enough. There's 30 days in between now and April 5th. Why is that not going to be sooner? Why can we not have our Cypress Police Department come in and train us either next week or sooner than that? Because if we have such a good relationship with them and they work so well with us, why are they not helping us out sooner and helping the students feel safer and more protected? Well, we're actively working with them and scheduling the right people to make sure that the right officers are doing the training and able to provide uh, it to our staff. So there's actually two different um, pieces to this. April 5th, we'd actually identified, we've been working on this for several months, this was just a coincidence, and so actually Emily was going to be sending something out yesterday on our active shooter drill. We just thought probably that wasn't a great timing, even considering, but we had been working on this, we just had our final meeting last week in preparing the active shooter drill. Our faculty, you know, in a in a non-emergency situation, the goal was April 5th, we could give our faculty enough time, they could inform you, you know, it wouldn't disrupt the instruction. So the April 5th drill was already planned in, in order to do anyways. We need to be doing this every, every year, perhaps every semester. So that was the first training drill. Um, we could consider changing it, but again, being able to give everyone advance notice now the other training that um, that uh, Roland is talking about, that is the train the trainer working with you in your spaces. So that is that is going to be ongoing and starting immediately. And we again that was something we already we had a campus forum in December and that came out of that campus forum. And the Cypress Police said yes, we'll come on campus. We'll kind of walk you through your environment. So those are different things, and that will be ongoing all the time. So once they train our campus safety staff, they can make appointments with each of the areas to do the training. So um, what we could do certainly is, um, these are a lot of really good ideas, is again posting some of those, making sure that video is visible so people can go into my gateway and look at it, making sure that our process 
of what do you do in the event of emergency, we can put that out immediately and then go through the drill on the 5th. So that's kind of the thinking around that. Um, it isn't in response to this emergency, it was already planned, and it should be something that's ongoing all the time that we should be informing people. Um, also, tagging on to that, is there any way to move that up closer? I know you have to meet with people and organize and you know, let all the faculty know that they're gonna do this training, but I, as a student, I don't feel safe right now. And that's probably not gonna change until something happens immediately. One thing I'd like to say is that uh, everything worked perfectly in the incident we just had. And uh, we, we were able to work together with uh, different police departments, gather information, uh, get photos, obtain uh, uh, information on this person, uh, talk to other staff members, and get a background on uh, things that this person had done uh, we, had, we looked at our reports and determined uh, the extent of the incident that got him suspended in the first place. So all this was done uh, between 10 and midnight uh, Sunday night. And the additional was just for the police department to be able to do their side of it. So we, we have a lot of things going and obtain a lot of information before uh, any, while everybody was uh, maybe sleeping before they came to school but we're always working to improve and get more information and we're improving our uh, uh, systems that we have internally at uh, safety so that we can get uh, even quicker and better information with photographs and things so that we can respond better to questions or concerns that we have about uh, uh, situations on campus. But I hear what you're saying and, and that may be something that comes out of this conversation that if people are feeling the need that there's an immediate response to this particular emergency, in, in many ways today is no different than last week. We just have more awareness that our campus might have been under threat. Again, we don't know for sure it was. It could have been an idle threat, but we, again, will always move on the safe side rather than take a chance. That cannot happen. So I we will I can't answer that. We need to kind of talk about that. But I hear what you're saying. It's more of the emotional response and the need to feel that you're being taken care of and that you have the knowledge that you need to protect yourself. So so we will we will talk about that. I think that's something like um, had the okay. had the family member of the suspect not given us anything or had they not heard anything, there would have been a school shooting either sometime this week or next week or it would have been soon. And we would not have known about it other than this kid's erratic behavior. So actually I would make that conclusion because again there's absolutely no evidence that this person owned a gun. Um, and there are some other circumstances that we actually can't share with you that lead us to believe it was sort of an idle and momentary thing. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. What happens next time? What happens if it's somebody else? And again, I want to go back to what Roland said. That's where see something, say something is absolutely essential. That is the way that every single one of us has that responsibility in this room. So again, I would caution you from drawing that line that because someone said, I'm going to shoot up a school, that, that there would have been a school shooting. But we all know we live in the news, we live in a world where these things are happening. And so that's a larger discussion in terms of what we do in our country about that. But um, I guess what we're trying to impress upon you that we take this seriously, our campus safety takes this seriously. We are doing everything that we can to arm you with knowledge and communicate with you of what we will do and our commitment to you to keep you safe so you don't come to school feeling like you have to be afraid. But I can't 100% guarantee that. I just want to know, you to know that we're all invested in this and we all can help one another to create that knowledge. Hi, I'm Alex Brown, Campus Safety Coordinator. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Campus Safety Department. 
our safety staff or they want to find out what security measures are being to uh, protect safety officers or oftentimes first responders to part two crimes, part three crimes, and oftentimes part one crimes. Our current policy is outdated. It's a observer report. So these are concerns that have been brought towards me that I want to present towards you and make, get the shed some light on that. It's a, a good point. Uh, we'll make sure that we put it on our next agenda item for president staff. Obviously, that's something that you know board policy needs to work its way through procedure. But I, you know, I think having a good uh, informed discussion about that is important. Uh, I'm put that on my agenda for next time and assure you we'll be in discussion on that. And, and since I have the mic with me, uh, just express to you. I'm, I'm I am uh, sorry that you fear for your safety the way you do. It, it is a, a valid expression, I, and I don't want anything you said to diminish that at all. Um, so I was just sent a phone number for a, a referral line for you know students and, and employees to be able to take advantage of. Uh, we will be sharing that with our community so that uh, you and and others have an additional resource. And I, I would add also our student health center. You, know, you all pay the, the fee to use that student center, and, and I would encourage everyone on an ongoing basis to use the resources that are here. And if you don't know the resources, you know, ask where might I get help for this, or who might I talk to about that. I, I know for all my colleagues in the room, we really are here for you as students. And it is our job and our passion to make sure that your needs are met. So, you know, sometimes the best thing to do is simply say, this thing is bothering me, who can I talk to? Or, you know, where can I get help with it? Um, so I just want to add on to what Maria said earlier. She had said, if you can get like a written statement of Christmas signature. I just want to clarify about that. You guys know the relationship between the cyber police, or the cyber PD, and you get this campus, but students only come here, they go to their cars, they come here, they do, do their classes, and then maybe study for a little bit and then go home. They don't know the relationship. So maybe the signature or the piece of paper could be posted onto an email or on the school's website and just clarifying the relationship that you guys do have. Because students, we don't really see all the little background, back, backstage um, operations that you guys do, do do as campus safety. So I just wanted to add on to what we had said. Well, that's passing for over thank you. You know, we can certainly do a better job communicating. Okay, so my name is Sarah. I'm staff here on the lab technician in the ceramic department. I've gone here for four years. I'm pretty much on my way out. Never in my four years has something like this happened. I've never felt unsafe on campus. Sometimes I'm here more than I am at my own home. Um, and when I got the email, yeah, it was really alarming, and I've been against firearms since I was old enough to understand about the control of the NRA and everything, and what I thought individually was, what can I do? And I think it's easy to, like, you know, quickly think about what can Cyprus Campus Safety do, but, like, what can we do as individuals? Like, we weren't given not that much information, it was a pretty big email, so the top of our head, we're like, there's a shooting. You know, before we found out there was a, a confirmed weapon or anything, we think shooting because there's an increasing correlation between schools and shootings. So if people here, from what I'm understanding from all the comments is everyone's kind of concerned about guns, there is more we can do individually about how we feel about guns and how we feel unsafe. And I was thinking about having a meeting on campus because what happened in Florida, the reason why there's so much recognition is because those high school students are standing up and saying something and they're saying no more. So even though this was just a threat, there are things, all of us individually, that we can do if we're uncomfortable. And I'm not saying that there's not more that the school can do because in every situation there is. I'm just saying that we need to live internally and we are as powerful as campus safety. We are as powerful as police officers. And with our voice, we can do a lot more than just 
like this meeting is helpful, but much more than that. We can take physical action. And I just wanted to make that comment and make other students maybe realize what I came to realize. From a uh, communication standpoint, not a, a political standpoint, the students in Parkland a month ago didn't really have a, a strong voice, right? What happened increased their voice, I think, you know, from your perspective as members of the community, you have a voice and part of our curriculum, part of our student learning outcomes is, you know, civic or global, global engagement. And so this institution, this district encourages our, our students specifically to have and use a voice and be involved in a, on a large scale. Uh, I just want to add on to your comment. Um, associate students that I know we're doing, um, we're trying to participate in the Never Again movement and walking out of the classroom for 17 minutes on March 14th. And um, I hope I'm not I'm not going out of line or anything like that, but I know we're um, trying to form student body and have students physically go to the next academic city, uh, academic senate meeting this Thursday. I've been trying to pass out posters as much as I can. Uh, associate students that. Uh, have tried to do this, but we're trying to get students' voices heard at this next academic senate meeting. So if you would like, attend with us on Thursday at 2.45, we're going to meet in Student Activity Center. And if you can tell faculty too, if you can tell your students, if you can tell other faculty members about this movement that we're trying to participate in and try to do something about it. And we're going to do petitions, um, a Google form that's going to be on the poster as well. It's an NRA code. You can, iPhones can petition there. It's a Google form. Uh, as well as we're having a petition at the actual walkout where we can send it to our uh, local congressman. What did you say that was again? Uh, the actual academic senate meeting is going to be on Thursday, but the walkout is going to be March 14th, but we can't have the walkout unless we go to the academic senate meeting. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up is that a lot of this stuff, the, the forum today that we're having, this has all been done regard, regarding this incident that uh, just recently happened. For the eight months that I've been here, I can say that I have continuously seen improvements in safety and technology equipment that is being brought onto the campus in the form of cameras, uh, the surveillance, our uh, uh, radios that we have are better than they were a year ago. We are always looking at improvement. We're always looking at a better way to do things, and we're bringing those improvements to the campus. Uh, one common thread that all these incidents that you can think of in the, in, in the last 10 years have in common is mental illness. And the person isn't on this campus today that made the threat because he's not under arrest. He's in a hospital receiving treatment. So that is one thing that we have to think about is the mental health care and things that are going on. And if you see somebody who you know is acting different, if you see somebody who is really angry at the world or at a specific person or is having a tough time to help that person get the uh, help that they need so that they don't make threats or get drunk and say something that they shouldn't say and end up getting uh, into trouble. Uh, I want to also elaborate on that. Um, and we have a few people here, uh, Teresa Cassidy. Uh, who represent our ch main chat, um, but they're as part of our, so chat is a, a way for us to notify uh, if we have, if there's a student that's at risk or um, acting differently or oddly or behaviorally, that we can get this across the campus. So, but we also have a new, and this is for students as well as staff and faculty. We have a program called Cognito, K-O-G-N-I-T-O. That's part of our chat program, and you can access this online. We're going to make it a little bit more easy to find, but it's a training to go through. So students can go through the training about how to identify other at-risk students. Faculty and staff can go through the training. There's also an LGBTQ module. So we are trying to train ourselves, too, to recognize when people are under duress, and it's stress, or mental illness, I mean, how do you tell the difference? You know, none of us are health professionals. We also, as Mark mentioned, have a health center, and I encourage anybody in this room, whether you're an employee or whether you're a student, to access our services here if you need somebody to talk to. And if you don't feel comfortable talking in a forum like this, that information can then uh, funnel to us and to our chat team so that we can address these 
issues that you're talking about in a private and confidential way, but uh, to help you make, make you feel safer in the environment. I think definitely a takeaway from this forum is all the students' concerns that they take time out of their class, and this forum was at 12 o'clock, which is one of the prime times where students are in classrooms, but they took time off to express their concerns, and I think that's something that shouldn't be taken lightly. We need to also not take lightly our safety um, campus concerns, because their concerns are, this, are as equally as the student concerns as well. I think, um, what well, Robbie was saying that the associated students are going to um, go to the academic senate meeting where they will be passing a resolution saying that professors will also support the walkout. I as I as an AS president, I'm scared if we do have if we do have the march because who is going to protect our students that are marching when our campus safety isn't armed? How are we going? How am I going to? I tell people to group up so we can make a change when I'm scared that because we're going to be in a group in a public place they could risk their lives. I don't want to risk anybody's lives. I just want their concerns to be dealt with immediately because I do not like hearing students say they do not feel safe on this campus. So Maria, I hope that you don't walk away from this feeling that the campus is not, is taking what you're saying lightly. So that's number one. And we will be talking about all of the things that we've heard. Um, again, I so the march has not been declared. We are allowing students to drive this. Um, we will do what we can to support it once you decide what you are planning on doing. Um, so again, nobody in this room is taking it lightly. We want to make sure any action that we ever take is a true action and not just a placebo to make people feel that they're safer when it's actually not actually doing something. So again, I want to go back to Park Lane. There were armed guards on that campus. It did not prevent 17 people from being shot. Guns are the problem. But at the same time, we hear you. We will talk about this. Um, you know, I, I, I will just tell you my own bias, and that is that. Cyprus is a very special place, we, and it's based on the culture here. It's based on our fabulous students, our fabulous staff and faculty. And when you change that dynamic by having armed guards at every checkpoint at this campus, you have a different campus. And I want to make sure whatever we do is actually going to address the fear and address the problems rather than having a major response to make people feel temporarily better, but changes the entire reason why people come to Cypress College. So I'm not saying we know what we're going to do or what, but, but all of those things have to be discussed because there are unintended consequences to every decision that you make. And our goal is to, is to always be as preemptive as we can and communicate with you honestly and openly. So, we can continue talking about this, but I don't want you to walk away feeling that we don't take your, your concerns seriously. I have a question. Um, Doreen, I'm Doreen Biasino and faculty here. Um, several people did not receive the text, and I know some was because their phone wasn't registered. Um, and I, I heard people also say that they received the text before, but they did not get the text this time. Is there a way, maybe on April 5th or another day that we're doing the um, training, that they can also test the phone system again and make sure that we do get the text next time? And then one more thing. The active shooter drill is on the website. I just showed it in my class last week. So it is available. And it's really good to watch. Yeah, Dorian, uh, all the previous drill stuff is on the website. So anything we've used in the past is there including how to sign up for the text messages. So let me try to make sure I get all of them. One, yes, we will test the communication system uh, during the drill. Two, uh, you know, we are addressing the issues that we've heard about immediately. So you know, I don't want to wait on those. We have experienced issues with text messaging over the past. My understanding is because mass text communication is you know, not something that's baked into the phone system all kind of a hack. So we, every time we have tested the system, we find little flaws. We work with uh, 
district I asked to resolve them, but I will be sending out an email uh, with the link in it so that anyone who had issues with the text messaging, I can collect that information. You know, that might be diagnosing down to a phone number level that was a problem. It may be identifying that people weren't signed up. Our understanding was that Banner feeds this information automatically to our tech system. So I will be asking that we get back to our vendor to clarify that process and to make sure that that's working. I know that's a concern. We saw that quite a bit in the comments. Good afternoon, ma'am. There was a study done on the safety of the overall district about a year ago. Is there a way to touch bases on what the recommendations were for that study and provide a copy of the report? I'm going to let the big boss answer this question. Thank you, ma'am. We did have that security analysis done about a year ago, and we've already enacted some of the uh, recommendations. Um, we have hired an interim district director of uh, safety. We've talked about doing consistent training across the district, being on the same page. Part of what we do have to do, and I've, I've heard that again today, um, everybody needs to know what to do across the district. Um, and we need to have our security officers trained consistently across the district. So that's one of the things that, um, that we will begin immediately. Um, there's also recommendations about things like you know, uniforms. Um, I will tell you that one of the recommendations was work with our local police departments because their training is consistent. They know how to use armed weapons. Um, I, I hear your concerns and I agree with you. We want to get them here on campus as soon as we can when there is an incident, um, but understand that if we have our own set of armed guards or if we carry uh, weapons on campus, that creates another whole issue in terms of how we train people, how we make sure that we are doing it well. And, and I don't think, honestly, I don't think we can do that as well as the local police department. So it gets back to how do we maintain a good relationship with that and constantly improve it and constantly improve the, the speed of time for them to get here. So those are some of the recommendations that came out of the report um, that we are taking action on. Thank you. Uh, I just had a question in regards to the lockers. Like, are we regulating what's inside the lockers or the storage units around the campus? Uh, the way, uh, like, are we checking them every night to make sure that there's no weapons inside there? So, for example, like, because uh, as Sima said before, the individual, like, they never found the weapons that he was going to use. So, are they maybe in campus, or? Uh, so, he was, he does not have a firearm registered to him at all. And they searched his home, and he did not have any evidence. So, I guess all I'm trying to, in this particular case, there really is no evidence that this person had a weapon at all. Um, in, term, in terms of your answer about the lockers, um, we do not search in, uh, lockers that are assigned to students. That's their personal area. Um, in terms of sheds and things like that, that's mostly used by our maintenance and operations. I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Basically, we, we do check things on campus to the best of our knowledge. Most of these lockers that are assigned are assigned to individuals in the different departments and areas where they actually know who the individuals are. So I'm certain that if there's any suspicions of any type of item like that, the person who issues those lockers will probably make those concerns up to them. But it's kind of done in a more micro area, which is probably better managed that way. Also, I have a second question. Uh, is there, is there, or is there going to be like an entire code uh, allowing and not allowing just students what to wear and not to wear? I mean, like, like, is there going to be a lot like large coats to wear? So, or like, just minimize the the risk of sneaking weapons inside the campus? Like, are we going to allow certain attire? You know, we haven't talked about that. We have certainly haven't considered it. Um, I will write that down as one of the questions or suggestions. Again, I, I want to go back to what makes an open society what it is and what makes our campus an open campus. We, you notice we don't have fences around our campus and uh, entrances at every area. Um, those are all options 
in the world that we're living in, but it does have unintended consequences. It changes how you feel about your learning environment. So we haven't discussed that. We certainly can. Um, but again, that will have to take some discussion and some input because that changes how you as a student come to our school, as our, our faculty, our staff. That's going to change, right? So I just want to I'll put that out there. I had not actually heard that before, so we'll, we'll take that into consideration. I know uh, several people are starting to leave before everyone goes. The link that was distributed related to this form, the Qualtrex survey, will remain open so you can continue to share your thoughts and concerns. It, you know, it's important that we hear from everybody who feels like there is something to share or something they have to say. So keep that link handy, and we will also be reviewing the comments that are listed. So um, again, those who have to leave, I know we've gone over, you're certainly welcome to get up at any time. We'll continue the conversation as long as people want to have the discussion, but I don't want to keep anyone here past the time that they're able to stay. Um, so if you would like to leave, please just get up, but we will continue the conversation. And thank you, Dr. Marshall, for attending. We really appreciate it. Uh, one, last, one last remark, uh, um, Dean. Um, I, 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 um, I, I shared myself with the community when my brother, Lawrence Henrivi, is a police officer and I, and I guess uh, this campus could need a uh, little donation from the police department, from if you guys want. Um, so, so you guys can have canine dogs uh, 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 24 hours that train, train, train good dogs, like not to like bite people, only to sniff if there's something they have bad and everything like that, and um, they could uh, they could make the campus more safer, and people could be like like they say they like they could be more more welcome to this this campus. Okay, thank you. I know we touched on a lot of points today, and um, is there a way that, I know you guys have talked about policy and changing things and what's going to happen, is there a way to follow up and let everyone, including students and staff know what you guys plan on doing in the future, in the future? just because I know, you know, this all came about because of the incident from yesterday, but in the society we live, we live in, we do have to be proactive, so I would like to, the follow up as far as what answers you guys have gotten or what answers you will get or what changes will be made. I think that's another problem with transparency. We haven't been informed of a lot of things that are going on. Okay, um, I'll let uh, Mark also chime in on this, but just to address it, uh, we will we will be sending out an update to the campus for things like Cognito, the link again where you can provide your comments, um, some of the things that came out of this forum. So we will send a follow up immediately in terms of long term changes those things will be ongoing. And so I think your suggestion is great that we just make this a habit to update people on the campus security measures. I think that's what you're asking for. Um, so I think that's a great suggestion and we can, we can do that on that. Thank you. I'd just say in terms of an you know, ongoing basis, this is the type of thing that we do in the access newsletter that goes to not only all of our employees, but all of our students. Typical week, uh, about 35 percent of the recipients open that up. So um, I would just encourage that as you talk to colleagues and talk to other students, you know, remind that communication is a two-way process, and folks have to be willing to engage in the, in the other end of it. And, you, know, you know, my staff works very, very diligently to make it interesting and relevant to what we have uh, going on on campus. It's busy. I know. I have a lot of unread emails in my box too, um, but it's a, it's a two-way process, so yes, we will keep it top of mind, but if I can beg a little help in uh, reaching out to, to colleagues and students to actually read or scan the headlines. What if we have an in-progress forum again so everyone can see what's going on and what the 
So, um, Maria, maybe you want to talk to the Associated Students, too, to make a recommendation if you're interested in doing so. We did do a forum in December. This one is sort of unexpected, but would you be looking for a forum every semester? Um, again, you know, you, you acknowledge we picked 12 noon thinking, well, we could catch people as they were ending or before they started. You know, there's really no perfect time, is there? And maybe we need to be doing uh, you know, changing up the times, but is that what your is that your recommendation? Is once a semester? Um, I think there should just be a forum like in the next two weeks, seeing what the progress is going, what questions are being answered, and things like that. Because I feel they need to feel safe, like now, not in at the end of the semester. Hi, um, I'm Melissa, I'm a student here. Um, I was wondering if maybe, because we usually have a shooter drill um, once a semester, that's all right, but what if we had like a second one, and like you said before, um, these things do happen and they happen unexpectedly, they're not planned. Um, what if we did another drill, but like we don't really tell anyone about it and it, it can, like happens spontaneously, so then students get more of that sense, because like, yeah, it, it's dangerous, but like, People, they don't always like see this as an emergency and stuff. I've been in a few classes where kids will just be texting during a drill, or they'll just be like, "Oh, okay," you know. I I couldn't agree more. At the same time, I'll be honest. I would be very worried about doing a fake drill without notification because yeah. we might really be happy to. A lot of people have been driven to our health services if we do that. But I, I, I see your point, and I, again, we need to get that word out that we have to take this seriously. We, these girls are there to help protect us, and and the more that we know, the more that we're participating in them, and maybe this recent scare will drive that home in ways that we couldn't have done otherwise. One of the issues we saw with this incident simply uh, feedback from folks who did not believe that the text message and the emails were genuine. So, I, you know, that element of, of surprise, while I think it adds to a drill, is something that in this environment is really challenging. But I will say that watching the drills over the course of time, I've been here for almost 18 years, you know, five, ten years ago, people would react to drills and the students would email us back and say, this is more high school, I don't want these. And over the last you know, series of drills, and we do them every semester, not all of them after shooter drills, it, it is the students who are communicating to us, hey, I saw other students texting during the drill. My uh, you know, class was canceled and we didn't get to participate. And so that kind of peer pressure with your classmates to take these drills seriously is helpful to us. See the change of that mindset shift. Hi, um, I'm Amber. I'm an interpreter here. Uh, so I've bounced around to all over campus. Um, and I've worked with many different teachers. And one thing that I've noticed across the board is trying to get everybody to keep the doors closed. I know you put in these great lock systems and you're taking all these great precautions, yeah. but then we're not getting the back or um, the professors to keep the doors closed or, you know, I have not made any comments like don't overreact, or it's stuffy, and that kind of thing. So I, I don't know what measures we can take, but I'm just not getting on that. Yeah, well. I know that. I'm Walter, from international students. So actually, I want to say about this point of study. I mean, like, how good is that? I have international students as well. Because yesterday, when I saw it in Facebook, on Facebook, everyone just concerned that they haven't seen this before. They haven't seen that incident. They haven't seen a shooting, violence, violation issue. But right now, they just saw it. And they were. They, they would be afraid. I mean, 
I'm in a play on that, and I asked me, is it safe for them to to study, you know, write this education? And I, I, I don't know how to answer to them, but I hope that you guys can answer to them for me. Because they don't want to see anything, any incidents, any violations inside the stipends. I'm, I'm sure for that. And what could, how could I just answer to them? I, how, could I answer, how could I answer the questions to the international students? How could I answer to them, how does, how does it say? How does it say? I'm serious, because when I just saw they are grounded, I was reminded that we could lose every international students. They want to come here, and how could I answer for that? Thank you for, for the question and for expressing that. Number one, I, I think it is important for us to understand the feelings in our community. You know, I, I wish I could sit here and say, well, guaranteed 100%, this is safe, it's never going to happen here. You know, the first time you get on an airplane, you know, they close the doors and they immediately talk to you about the plane crashing, right? If you crash, here's your life pass. If, if, you know, something happens and we lose the cabin pressure, here's your mask, right? And, you know, over time those announcements have changed and it turned into, you know, some of the airlines do them in a funny manner, right? But at the end of the day, they're talking to you about things that you can do for your own safety. Here are the exits. Wear your seatbelt because we might hit turbulence. So I, I don't think there's a good answer to your question because what we all want to hear is, poof, this problem's gone, right? Um, I, I think the answer really lies in this is a college that is focused on taking this problem seriously. And we took extraordinary steps to make sure that law enforcement had time to prevent potentially an issue. Um, and, and then uh, on top of that, um, I'm trying to let the, let the station. Um, you know, so I, I would say, you know, tell, you, tell your friends that, that we are working. We want to hear your voices uh, on this issue, and, and we are focused on addressing it. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say is I just wanted to remind everybody that this was deemed by investigators, by the uh, Whittier Police Department, that this was not a credible threat uh, as far as his capacity to do something. And so this was essentially a comment was made, and that's all it was. And you might want to tell your parents that that's all it was, and, and make sure that they understand that it was something that was said, but that after uh, somebody investigated it, he didn't own any guns, he didn't have the capability, they thought, the uh, intent to really do this, and they looked into this, I'm sure, very well, and uh, this is what we pay the professionals to do, and they were focused on this one individual, and they did not find anything that they were concerned about, and uh, had labeled it as a non-credible threat. Uh, what erratic behavior? What erratic behavior did he show before when he was on campus? <clears throat> so about two weeks ago, uh, I mean last week, two different days, he had, he came to uh, the athletics field and. The first day there was actually no issue at all that he, since he had been suspended, the faculty called over to Dr. DeDios to find out if his suspension was still in place and it had expired. So he came back without, without incident and the second day he came back, there was, he was just not making a lot of sense. So that was, that was a concern and they brought it to our attention each time and that's really an essential piece. So we actually, when again we got the call, we could track different incidences that had happened um, so that there was something recorded. If he had just been a student's name, we, we didn't have any record of him being on campus since 2016, we might have to, treated this slightly differently. So that's where knowledge can help us. You know, the other thing I wanted to address to our international students, so again, I'm, I'm very sorry that you feel afraid and I am sorry that your family, you're far away from home 
and your family, obviously, they're concerned for your safety as well. Um, we consider Cyprus, the city of Cyprus, and this neighborhood in this area, a very community open oriented uh, area, and our campus is community oriented. And that does keep all of us safer because we know each other. That is essential. Um, we're not a faraway campus in a rural spot where we don't have our police departments. You know, we're bookended by Buenos Park and Cyprus. They're very, very close. Um, and again, we're having this conversation because the system works. And I really want to, I want to emphasize that. There are things that happen every single day on this campus that we don't bring to your attention because they turn out to be nothing. But we are taking them seriously. And so when this, this came out because we could not take the chance to put anybody in jeopardy here, but that is exactly what is supposed to happen. So unfortunately, it has made you feel more fearful because now you have knowledge that stuff happens, right? But our goal here is to let you know so that you also know that we are working 24 hours a day and your community is working 24 hours a day to make sure that we take everything seriously so you are safe. So knowledge is both power, but knowledge can also create anxiety. And I know that you all live in a world where there's a lot of anxiety from the information that we read each and every day. And that part I can't control, but I want to make sure, we all want to make sure that you have the knowledge that you need to know that we're working for you constantly. That was my, my other point, I'm sorry. I realized that when we send a text message out, that in and of itself is going to cause fear. And we try to be very, very careful with the language we use to be clear to be concise so that everybody doesn't look at it and say it's too long, didn't read it, but also to be accurate, right? We have to give you actionable information. So, it, you know, I know my mom saw the text message and the email that went out. The first thing she did was text me and, you know, a little heart and said, be safe, right? My same kind of thing from my wife. I have a 16-year-old, same kind of thing from him. I, I know this this raises fear that that is not our intention. Uh, but know that when we do communicate with you, what, we were, what we're telling you is to help you through a situation, not, not to scare you. So hopefully that brings the anxiety down a little bit too. You know what, when I step up to Americans, I felt that I have to question, is this my decision? And is it is this my choice to study you know, right, this education? I would say yes, because I'm coming here for one thing, studies, and also my career as well. And if one bullet or a gun to swallow to our body, what would you think? What would you think? Our careers will disappear. Our career will disappear, so I would do respect to everyone in this conference. I would say that our career would be disappear if one bullet inside a gun to swallow to our bodies. You know what it is. And we just hope that everyone just protect us. Because we are we are our future career. We are we are your friends. I mean, we are the best students. We're trying to study to achieve. To, to get what we want, to get what we want for transferring to the university for the, our, for the next futures. And well, just one thing, just about the, viola the, viol the violations issue, we just lost everything. I hope you understand for that. I uh, understand for international like us, please. Yeah, thank you, I, I do understand that. And, and every one of us here knows that we don't have a job without students. I, I want you to know what you just said with that passion. I have said to other employees here, when we had trouble with our text messaging system, we used to have two different text messaging systems, one for employees, one for students. And I said very passionately to the IT folks, we can't have this. We don't have time to send out two messages. And I know my colleagues up here, my colleagues across the campus, we all feel passionately that we're here for you. Primarily, we're here for your education. It's a beautiful learning environment. We have quality faculty. But you're right. If you know 
it takes one bullet for that to be irrelevant. So that's why why we're here in this room today, because we take very seriously your safety. Um, one final question. Um, you know the who did the threat was arrested. How long is gonna? How long is he gonna be arrested for? From what I understand, just a seventy-two hour hold. Yeah, he, he wasn't arrested. He was he was detained. It was a, a legal distinction, so I don't want you know bad information to stand. Um, you know, we anticipate to hear from from our partners in law enforcement. You know, when that expires. Typically, it's considered a 72-hour hold, but I've seen people easily be released within the first day, and I've seen people uh, occasionally held for as long as a week. And uh, this is as long as a person keeps expressing a uh, desire to hurt themselves or others. So once they stop expressing that, and the psychiatrist or whoever, health professional, deems it, uh, that person not as uh, big a threat as they were in our society that person is allowed to leave and so it's more of a medical issue than a police issue at that point if I could also add so we're concentrating on this one individual and, and the good news is we know who this individual is I say the, also the good news is that again um, he has a family is actually proactive in this. And that is a very, very important piece of this. His, fa his family called the police. That's a big deal. All of us have families. A lot of people in our families, for all the good intentions, don't want to do such, don't want to take that. So, so I want to reassure you that, again, we can't say to you, we're going to have this guy on 24-hour guard, and we're going to keep him away from Cyprus. We have we have mechanisms to make sure if he ever comes even close to, we can, the police can arrest him. That's a legal issue that we're pushing forward, and that should be in place in the next day or so. But but it is his his family who wants to make sure that he gets assistance and help, and will be a player in this. I really believe that because of the action they've already taken, and that's a huge step for them, and that's really good news for all of us. I think there was a question. Oh, someone wants something? Um, in the case of other students who are suspended or um, expelled, Theoretically, because we're an open campus, anybody can walk on, on campus, but in the case of other students, uh, how do we, what steps are being taken to assure that they do not enter the campus? Because if it's been long enough, they, nobody will know they're, they can just come on campus and be. Uh, well, that Roland answer in terms of we keep you know, photos, and, and he can elaborate on that, but um, again, legally, but as a suspension, uh, it, you can, in, this, in this individual, he had served his purpose, and expulsion is forever. So there's a difference, and that's why we're pursuing that at this time. But um, so, but I'll, I'll let Roland answer in terms of what the safety measures we take when somebody has been suspended. This isn't something that happens uh, that regularly, that somebody gets suspended, but when they do, uh, Campus Safety uh, prepares reports, they have copies of photos, uh, it's sent to all safety. If, uh, if we deem it necessary, it would go to the managers and staff. But I can tell you that regularly when somebody does get suspended, uh, we get phone calls that this person is back and we'll uh, respond and look into it. Okay, they're there to meet with a dean regarding their suspension or something like that. And that's how I know the system is working is that we get phone calls when a person is even supposed to respond to the campus and meet with an administrator or uh, comes on campus for whatever reason. We typically hear from the community that they're there and uh, like I said, this doesn't happen very often that we have to suspend somebody for a, a, a lengthy period of time. The, the typical suspension is a short period of time, a week, a couple of days, or 
or something like that. Uh, when it's something uh, dramatic and they're suspended for an entire year or a semester, uh, people know about it and they do contact campus safety regularly. Does it have to monitors the campus 24-7 and is looking at those pictures of the people who are not supposed to be on campus and being a lookout on that? We, we have people here 24-7 and they all have department issued uh, cell phones and these cell phones receive their emails and they receive campus safety emails and we have an internal group that we send information to to update everybody in campus safety uh, in regards to threats in regards to people who've been suspended in regards to improvements of procedures and things like that and so everybody can access their personal or i shouldn't say their personal their individual work email as well as campus safety emails as well as the emails we've set up for uh, suspicious people or pictures of people that we have uh, observed stealing uh, bicycles and things like that on campus. And so in their palm of their hand, they have all this information all the time that they're on duty and they're able to uh, view these things regularly. And we do come across these individuals again or we see them uh, uh, in subsequent uh, threats or I should say incidents and, and we're, related, we're able to relate them all together that the same person has done these things. So, uh, and of course we provide those pictures also to the Cypress Police Department. So uh, it, it's a system that we have developed over time. For example, when they had an incident here at the parking lots and people kept um, continuously reporting it, why didn't the cameras catch that? I'm not sure which incident you were referring to. Um, there was an incident where uh, a faculty reported um, seeing, somebody, seeing somebody in the lot. Um, I don't exactly remember the lot number, but there have been multiple um, claims about that. And I don't know, I don't know how campus safety didn't see that in the cameras. I'm not sure which incident specifically you're referring to, but I, I'm aware of several incidents where we don't get a call from staff or students until an hour later. Okay, but what and, then we, the and then we go back in our uh, camera system and we can view things and we have in fact seen and taken photos and uh, shared those photos with the police and with campus safety. Uh, but you're not monitoring the cameras yeah. we, we, we don't assign somebody to monitor the cameras necessarily and sit there. We, we have a tremendous number of cameras and we need a staff of people uh, probably as big as our safety staff is currently to monitor effectively all the cameras that we have. So we have a lot of cameras on this campus. Uh, I don't see the need necessarily to have somebody sitting there watching monitors as opposed to being visible in our campus so that people can see that there's a safety officer actually present and driving or walking around through the buildings. I find that to be more proactive, beneficial. They're able to talk to students. They're able to interact with students as opposed to having somebody behind a, a camera screen in a, in a safety office in a building that you know you can't see the number of people that are there. I think that's just one solemn, solemn opinion, and I think that we should have both. And I also think that when we do, if when we do have both, I think a student should be on those hiring committees, hiring the, um, the safety um, people. We'll, we'll take that under advisement for you. Thank you. Just concerned about this. I think I just received an application for um, new students. Or don't you guys just concerned about their conduct or the ethnic? So we know that this, this guy just used to have this situation, this issue, but we didn't know. Because we just know that they just, we just know that they are all the good guys. We just know that. But we didn't realize that they just like the evil guys. We didn't know their conducts. And how can we support, I mean, how are you guys supposed to let them go around the campus? And so he was not a student. He was not enrolled as a student. He had been suspended. And he, as, as soon as he came on campus, he was noticed by a faculty member who called over to see if he was allowed to be on campus. So if there, people were aware of what was going on. And he was not an enrolled student. And when he did behave badly, we suspended him. Thank you. Thank you.
If we're going to wrap up, maybe one more question, and I really appreciate everyone's questions and attention, and we will be sending something out. Of, there are some questions that will take longer to address, but to your question, Maria, we can revisit this at another forum, so thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm Jeremiah, by the way. Uh, so I really don't have a question. It's more of a suggestion, because this isn't the first time I've dealt with a threat to a school shooting. This is probably my fourth. Um, so... And I understand Not that. Not here, though, right? Uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> two, uh, two was at another high school, another was at another one. Uh, Sorry. Anyway. Um, but the thing I'm more concerned is when I was talking with a student yesterday, like right after you guys opened the campus back up, I asked him, I was like, do you know what to do when stuff like this happens? And he told me no. Now, just because I've dealt with this four times, I have an idea of what to do. But my suggestion is why don't we offer a curriculum for this? or at least an informative video. Something that students are mostly engaged in because students are mostly engaged with music or videos. So we did address that perhaps before you got here earlier, and we will be posting and making that available to students, uh, probably in your My Gateway, so that you can take a look at the video, and also we'll be addressing that in, term, in our active shooter drill as well, and, but we will make this information a lot more available to students. All right, well, this has been very, very helpful and productive, and again, we really appreciate all, everyone's attendance, and um, we, we want to make Cypress College um, an environment that you can walk in the doors and not feel that you have to worry about what your safety is. This is our primary uh, focus, so thank you. <laughs>